With that, I'd like to pass things over to Neil. Please welcome Neil Wood. Jonathan, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure working with you. I really appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we will have Q&A later, as Jonathan mentioned, and recording, so that'll help you out. You know, Rank Group is known as one of the top 20 sales training companies on the planet. And we are also known for extensive, stellar research. And here's some I wanted to share with you from our Rank Group Center for Sales Research. According to buyers we interviewed, top sellers usually finish first because they did things that the other sellers did not. So here's what we did with the research. We interviewed 489 sellers in more than 25 industries. We also interviewed 488 business buyers responsible for, as you can see here, $4.2 billion in purchases. And again, in more than 25 industries. And we asked them, what do the top performers do? With the people who close the sales, what do they do better than the rest? And what we realized is about 17% of all salespeople are considered top performers. And, and then the rest are second place finishers. So just some of the things that they did better is they listened. They paid attention. This is from the buyers. They did a better job of finding afflictions as well as aspirations. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the Rain Group uh, uh, language, uh, afflictions are those things that are holding you back, the stucks, the challenges, otherwise known as afflictions. And the aspirations are really their goals. Where would they like to go? And between those, between the afflictions and the aspirations, you have the value gap. All right, so when we interviewed them, what we found from, according to the buyers, 26%, only 26% of sellers were said to be good listeners. Think about this as you move around, right? If only 26% of sellers were said to be good listeners, the bar is really low. So if you want to excel in 2022, there are some things you can tweak and get better at that will put you in the top performers category. Now, today, obviously, we're talking about prospecting. And here's what we encourage you to do. Be more attentive from today going forward because it does make a difference in sales success. And by the way, if you would like a, a research report on, it's titled, What Sales Winners Do Differently, either reach out to us at, at Rain Group or uh, go to our website, all right? What Sales Winners Do Differently fascinating research. So um, we're going to keep this short and we'll dive into more details as we move forward. But um, fascinating. Now, one of the folks who typed in the Q&A said, uh, you know, it's really tough reaching people right now. And I, I want to just dispel what some people are saying. And that is, they're saying nobody wants to, well, nobody wants to get phone calls right now. Here's what we have found with our research. 82% of buyers accept meetings at least sometimes. Now, I want to clarify this. Doesn't mean they'll accept meetings all the time, but at least sometimes when proactively contacted. And 71% said when they're looking, when they have desire or dissatisfaction, 62% said when they're doing analysis, when they're trying to find a better plan or a better product and things like that. So I want to share just a quick story with you. I spoke to a top producer in Boston the other day. Uh, it's, this is with a startup company. Uh, last month, he sold $22,000 worth of software. Startup company. It's been in business about, about nine months. And I asked him, well, so that, that was really good. How'd you rank? He said, I was number one. I said, that's awesome. Well, where was number two? He said, he sold $2,000 worth of software. I said, wait a minute. You sold more than 10 times more software sales than he did. What's the difference? He said, well, I'll tell you, um, I never pitched product. And I've listened to his recordings when he's on the phone. I've listened to his sales on Salesforce. When he starts the call, he is just pitching product. And he said, what I do differently is I start to ask, you know, what are the challenges you're facing right now? Because I've worked with a lot of companies like yours. And generally, these are the three or four major challenges that people are trying to find resolve, resolve for. And, uh, and, and the the, the buyer would say, yeah, yeah, I'm dealing with that. I'm dealing with this. And he said, well, you know what? We have a lot of solutions for that. I'll tell you, we spoke with a few folks last week who had the same afflictions. And when we presented this and they applied it, they found success. So he said, that's it. I don't pitch product. And by the way, 
He joined this company five months ago. He's been number one in sales every single month. So I want you to think about that when you're prospecting. One of the biggest complaints that buyers have is sellers just show up and they pitch, pitch, pitch. And that's just not what they want. You've got to talk to them about what's, you know, what's concerning them. What, what's the challenge they're dealing with? So I want to introduce WAVE. And the W in WAVE stands for winner's mindset. And winners always set goals and they believe they will achieve them. Now, I want to just take a sidestep on goals. I've studied successful people for, at this point, 40 years. And here's what I have found. About 10% of the population have goals that are written down. However, when Rain Group interviewed top, the top salespeople, the elite, the, the super successful salespeople, every single one of them had goals that are written down. So I want you to think about the winner's mindset. They expect to win. And they do all they can to win in terms of preparation and joining seminars and things like this. Uh, secondly, is the A is the attraction campaign. So we found that sales winners apply a multi-touch, multimodal, customized outreach process. I'll talk more about that going forward. The V in Wave is value. Every interaction you have, whether it's an email or a voicemail or even uh, an email or a text or anything you're doing, even face-to-face. -face. And I know a lot of people are getting back to face-to-face, -to -face, which we all enjoy. Always make sure you add some sort of value, whether it's research or a sales idea or a success story. You should have uh, at least a dozen success stories in your back pocket, you know, so to, so to speak, uh, where you can add value after they talk about an affliction they have. And finally, this is where I find many people fall flat execution. Focus on the important activities. Avoid the distractions. Execute in the zone. One of the best tips I learned from a book titled, uh, uh, not today, sorry about that, Extreme Productivity, Nine Habits of Extreme Productivity, was cut the distractions out. So I know when I was prospecting, and I loved prospecting, really enjoyed it, I find it a bit of a, of a game, a bit of a challenge. I made sure I turned my email off, my phone off, except for the phone I was using, and I cut out all distractions, and I was laser focused for one hour at a time, and then I take a little break. We will talk more about that in a little bit. When you do that, you are executing in the zone. So keep wave on your, uh, on your, you know, the, the front of your mind, even if you want to do a screenshot of this. And keep in mind, you're going to get a PDF of the presentation anyway. So what we have found is the biggest differentiator is value. And that's what most sellers don't provide, right? You want buyers to do something. You want them to buy something. You want them to take action. You need to provide value that inspires that action. So as I mentioned, provide value at each interaction. Now, here's another topic I've talked about for 25 years, and that is a solid value proposition. So there are three legs to this stool. Number one is resonate, right? If you can get their attention, the buyer's attention, in terms of why act and why now. Now you have their attention, right? And let me just pop back to this, pardon me. And the other thing you wanna talk about is differentiate. So we have why act, why now? So some of you are thinking, wait a minute, what's the why now? Well, maybe prices are going up. Maybe you have a special deal right now. Maybe they have a big problem that needs to get resolved. And that's why why act and why now? Right. So whatever the reasons are, you want to resonate with your buyer. Secondly, and again, this is another place I see people really drop the ball. When a buyer asks, what makes you different? Now, I've done training on this with tens of thousands of people. And I'll tell you what most people said. Well, Neil, you know, we're uh, my, our company is 100 years old. You know what? So what? A lot of people can say that. What? makes you different? What sets you apart from everybody else? Why should they take a look at you? And if you don't have something that differentiates you, I encourage you to talk to your colleagues and brainstorm. Pick three or four of your colleagues and ask them, what makes us different? And the next time somebody asks, what makes you different and why us? You should have it at the top of your mind. And so a lot of people will say, well, I don't know if I'll remember it. Script it out. And so a lot of people raise their eyes. Oh my gosh, you're asking me to script. Think about this. Think about your favorite movie. Everything they said and everything they did, they, the actors, was scripted. 
but they rehearsed it so many times, it just rolled off their tongue. So find something that differentiates you from the competition. It's one of the things that separated me from the rest of the pack when I was in sales. I knew exactly what made us different. And finally, substantiate. Why should they trust you? So here's where those stories come in to say, you know, we've met with many companies like yours and they've had these afflictions. And here's what we did for them. And here's what the solution was and the success. Maybe it's better ROI. Uh, maybe they ever increased their sales or their revenue, whatever it is, have those success stories su to substantiate why they can trust you. Okay, so that's really important. So the value proposition of this is the collection of reasons why a buyer buys, right, overall. And for the meeting, when you're prospecting, it's a collection of reasons why buyers say yes to an initial meeting with you. So keep in mind, there are articles, and I've seen them now for 15 years, cold, cold, uh, cold calling is dead. It's not dead. It continues to thrive. It's just that as sellers, we have to be better. We have to fine tune our process. We have to get better at, at rehearsing our script and just having it roll off our tongue and be effective. So uh, I'm, I'm just here to tell you that if you can find a way to lure them out and grab their attention, you'll get some really good things happening. And prospecting will just be much easier for you in 2022. So again, here's the value proposition overall. You've already seen this. And what I want you to do as we move forward is focus here on resonate, right? Why act? Why now? What, you know, what's in it for them? You think about the number one radio station in the world. On the planet, it's W-I-I-F-M. So write that down, please. W-I-I-F-M. It stands for what's in it for me. Because this is what buyers are wondering, right? What do you want? Now, I, I did sales in Boston for many, many, many years. And when I would prospect, uh, many of them would say, because they didn't know me, oh, what do you got? It's like one word, W-H-A-D-D-Y-A-G-O-T. What do you got? And it was, it was funny. And of course, they had to have a good answer for that right away. And I tried to keep that same pace and tone that they did. But here you want to focus on why act and why now and what's in it for them. And the other thing we like to tease here in terms of differentiate and substantiate uh, and then build that up over time. But number one, you want to focus on, you know, resonate. Why act and why now? Now, I talked about this earlier in terms of top sellers versus second place. And when you think about second place, you know what that means. They didn't, they didn't close the deal. So when you want to look at influential content and what content do buyers rank as most influential? Again, this came from our research, the Sales Prospecting Rain Group Center for Sales Research. Number one, what, as far as what buyers rank as most influential, primary relevant research. Number two is capabilities descriptions. What have you done? How did you do it? What were the results? The other thing, number three, is 100% customized content. They don't want to just be painted with the same brush. So what I've learned with the top folks who really are successful with prospecting, they do their research. They know what the challenges are that the company is facing, whether it is an annual report or whatever they can find on Google, they find something that's specific so they can customize their content when they're prospecting. Number four is insight on how offerings solve problems. Now notice, I didn't say talk about your product. How did your offering solve problems? And this is where I bring in the success stories also to say, and by the way, the success stories need to be about 60 to maybe uh, 60 seconds to two minutes. This is not a long-winded five-minute story that drags on and on and on like a bad joke, right? Have successful stories. Um, sometimes you can name the company that you worked with if they allow that, and sometimes not. And finally, number five, best practice methodology. One of the things I did, and I mentioned this earlier, that differentiated me from all the competitors I had in New England when I covered the Boston, New England area, is I shared best practices. So every time I showed up at, at, at a buyer's office, whether it's a client or a prospect, they'd say, hey, what's working? And I could go on and on and on for five minutes about what's working, different success stories, and they really appreciated that. And my nickname at the, you know, as we moved on was Mr. Value Added, because every time I showed up, I was adding some sort of value that was relevant to their business. So keep those things in mind. And by the way, 
when we did the research for the buyers and sellers, we found that there are about 42 key components that sales winners did better than the rest of the pack. So keep that in mind, all right, as you move forward. The attraction campaign, this is big. You know, a lot of people say, Neil, I want to prospect like crazy in 20, 2022. My question to them is, who do you want to prospect to, right? Do you want to just try to call everybody? I remember talking to uh, one of my clients uh, a few years ago, and he said, I'm really going to prospect this year. And I said, well, who do you want? He said, um, really anybody. I'm not specific. And I said, you got to narrow that focus down. Otherwise, you could call on 10,000 people. Who do you really want? What is your target market? And if you take time, and now we're getting towards the holiday, we have some free time, narrowly focus exactly who you want. What do they look like? Um, ideally, um, what do they sell? Well, what, you know, age group even, who do you want to call on? You got to narrow that down. And when you do, then you create an attraction campaign. And that's a multi-touch, multimodal, customized outreach process. And that makes a big difference. Again, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. How to reach important buyers. This is a big one. And this came up in the Q&A just a moment ago. Um, the attraction campaign covers what I just said, multimodal, multi-touch, customized, Remember, I talked about customized, not just painting everything with the same brush. Outreach process designed to generate meetings with buyers through ongoing one-to-one -one effort. Now, I always prefer to one-to-one, -one, at least just to get things going a little bit. And then, you know, from there, we may, then we can meet with a group of people. So you want to draw buyers into wanting to talk to you because of a compelling value offer, right? When you think of the campaign, I want you to think of that coordinated effort over time to begin a meaningful interaction with a potential buyer. What do I mean by over time? Here's what I find people do. They'll say, Neil, my prospecting is not working. I said, well, what'd you do? Well, I, I called once, I couldn't get through, so I didn't bother. Wait a minute, we've got research on that. Don't just call once. This is gonna take some time. It's gonna take some effort. Think about this, right? Every one of us were babies at one time trying to learn how to walk. How many times do you give a baby a chance to, to learn how to walk? as many times as it takes. Imagine if you only let them try once, like, yeah, so that's not gonna work out. Nice try. So no, when it comes to prospecting, you've gotta be consistent. You gotta be persistent. Now you also have to know when to walk away and we'll talk about that, but you know, an attraction campaign can really include uh, creating a campaign brief. You know, Overall, what are you trying to accomplish? With whom, uh, how often? Social media, right? Email tactics, phone tactics. There isn't just one way that works successfully every single time. It really is multimodal that makes a big difference. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So identify your targets. I talked about that already. Have a big enough list. Now, I have had tremendous success on, uh, on LinkedIn in terms of finding people to prospect. Uh, you also wanna make sure you have updated information. LinkedIn is pretty handy and it's interesting. Uh, somebody, someone last week when I was doing a training session said, you know, Neil, I don't know about LinkedIn. It seems like the, the new Facebook. And I had to really correct them right away because it's not at all. So I asked them a question. How many folks do you think subscribe on LinkedIn? How many members do they have? And they said, well, I don't know, maybe 5 million, 25 million, 50 million, 740 million subscribers are on LinkedIn. In fact, when you reach out to an executive, 82% of executives, when they see your message or get your voicemail or your email, 82% will search you on LinkedIn to see if you're relevant. So if you haven't updated your profile on LinkedIn, I encourage you strongly, especially if you're prospecting in 2022. It makes a big difference. Also, target the right level. Who do you want to talk to? You know, do you want to talk to CEOs, CFOs, CTOs? Who's your market? So you want to target at the right level and you want to use all the tools you possibly can. Tools like LinkedIn Navigators, I mentioned, is a great way to find targets that meet your specific criteria. And you can set these right up in, in LinkedIn to really narrow it down. Um, again, when I talk about targeting, it's, it's much more difficult to work your way up in an organization than it is to get referred down. So when you start low, it's really an uphill battle right? It's just an uphill battle for you. You're more likely to find the right decision maker if you start at the top, at the C-suite, and then you get referred down. So just keep that in mind. 
the um, there's so many tricks to this. And what I've found is some people will say, you know, Neil, you shared 20 ideas. I found four or five nuggets that I can really apply right now because uh, you can't you can't apply a hundred ideas. So you narrow, narrow it down is okay. Based on this shot here, identifying your targets, do I have a big enough list? Do I have updated information? Have I Googled the company to find out what's going on? Uh, you know, what's in the news? I get updates uh, from Google on my key prospects in, uh, every, every week in terms of what's going on with the company, who they acquire, who they hire, what are they going through? So I always wanna make sure I'm targeting the right level and using the tools available to me. But think about when I was prospecting back in the, in the 80s, whole different world, right? Internet wasn't a, wasn't a big thing. It wasn't even really uh, a small thing at that point. You have so many tools at your fingertips right now. I encourage you to use them. Then you want to make the right offer. You already know which con content resonates, but you need to pick the best content for the target using the best channel for the target on a schedule that makes sense. So let's talk about content for a moment. Has to be a reason they want to spend time with you. Something has to be in it for them. Remember WIIFM. It's got to be something of value. Again, research, case study, invitation to something they'd find value, maybe a webinar or something like that. Giving them something, offering them uh, your effort to do something in exchange for their time. Now, one of the challenges I, I ran into when I was prospecting is a lot of people hadn't heard of my company, the company I was with back in the 80s and 90s. So one of the tricks I used that I created was asking for a 10 minute appointment. Now, again, this is gonna be face to face or it could be a phone call. And here's why I did it that way. One of the biggest complaints I, I heard from my clients of this, I'll tell you, I get these cold calls and these people wanna talk for an hour. I don't have an hour. You know, I'm only here for nine hours a day and I really wanna be productive. I thought, well, how do we get around that? So I would call folks or email or whatever and ask, uh, I'd like to set up a 10 minute appointment. And they say, what? I'd say, no, really, 10 minute appointment, five minutes to hear about your business. And then maybe the next three or four minutes to tell you based on what you told me about your challenges and your goals, right? Remember most, um, most sellers will only talk about the challenges. We always wanna talk about what are the aspirations? What are the goals? And they'd say, yeah, 10 minutes, that sounds good. When do you wanna come in? And I'd say, you tell me, I can come in in the morning. I start my appointments at seven. I wrap things up at six. What works best for you? I always want to be accommodating like that. And what we found, I'd set my watch when I got in there, had a little runner's watch, and uh, I let him talk and say, for the first five minutes or so, tell me about your business. You know, what are you trying to accomplish? What are your goals? Where do you want to go? And what are the things holding you back? I'd listen, listen, listen. I'd say, by the way, do you mind if I take notes? Remember, I talked about listening earlier. And they said, oh my God, seriously? You're going to pay attention? I said, I'm here to learn about you and your business. So yes, this is really important to me. And if it's okay with you, I am going to take notes. I'll tell you, it separated me from the pack right away. So with that, I've learned about the business and the challenges. And then usually I had some solutions that would tie right in because most people, most buyers are dealing with the same afflictions. So I'd share a solution. I'd say, you know, it's been nine, nine minutes. I promise you I'd only be 10. So uh, why don't I wrap things up here and let's schedule another time to visit. 90% of the time they'd say, no, 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 Neil, this is really good. Can you stay? Well, now I have permission and I'd stay as long as they wanted me to stay and go over sales ideas and success stories and all those things that made a big difference. So does a 10 minute appointment work? Absolutely. But you have to bring some content to it and the timing, you got to get it right. You got to space things out properly in terms of your marketing uh, and you know when you send an email, how often do you phone, how often do you use social media, things like that. And when it comes to the channel, I'll give you the easiest way that people like to be reached. Email works, and that's number one. Phone works, and that's number two. Number three is networking social media. And number four is direct mail. Now, I don't know how much direct mail you get. I get, I get a little bit. I do get a ton of emails. And uh, tell you, sadly, I delete most because they're poorly done. So I'm gonna give you a little tip here because we're gonna be doing a lot of prospecting in 2022. I'm gonna give you some tips on how to create more effective emails as well as how to get more attention on the phone. Now, I'm hoping you're using LinkedIn. Um, 
uh, again, with 740 million subscribers, it is a very successful way to reach people as you go forward. So emails, name, subject line. This is the big one. The subject line will either grab their attention and pull them in to read it, or they will have zero interest. So you wanna make sure you grab their attention in the subject line. And I'll give you a little example of, of the next steps. Um, hi, Lucas, your priority to attract top millennial talent jumped out at me in the Davos company annual report. So look what they've done here. They read the annual report, they found out what was really important to Lucas as far as a priority, and they put that in the subject line. Brief, right? Millennial hiring strategy. Remember what I talked about earlier, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? So uh, we worked with Outtel's HR team to clearly define the sense of purpose in their workplace culture. It's an overwhelming differentiator, up to a 20% uptick, uptick, uptick in accepted offers. So remember the three-legged stool I showed you, right? We wanna grab their attention, we wanna develop rapport and get them to think, wait, why act? Oh, wait a minute, we're trying to find millennial talent. This guy's got my attention right away and a 20% uptick in accepted offers. So why act? Those are two reasons why act. Are you exploring this approach? Let me know if you're interested in our research on why it resonates with top talent. I'm gonna be in Brussels in two weeks or Boston or Chicago or New York or San Diego, whatever. So we could even meet in person. Any chance you're free on the 14th, right? I try to be more specific like that in terms of um, why now, right? There's a sense of urgency. I didn't say I'll be in Brussels sometime in 2022. I'll be in Brussels in two weeks. Uh, are you free on the 14th? Narrow that down. Hey, by the way, worst case scenario, they reach back and say, you know, uh, Jonathan, I'm, I'm not available on the 14th. However, the 13th works if you're free and that'll work for me too. So um, makes it, this makes a big difference. Always keep in mind, W-I-I-F-M. And are there hints of why us or why trust? So when you do an email like this and you specifically send it to Lucas, as opposed to just a blast email to everybody, it shows that you spent the time to write to them individually. And it was specific. So it makes a big difference and you will grab their attention. 80% of buyers said that sending poorly written email is a top virtual selling mistake that sellers make. So remember the research I talked about earlier, and you can see this noted on the slide, a global survey of 528 buyers and sellers across the Americas EMEA and APAC conducted in April, May, 2020 in the wake of the pandemic and the massive economic disruption. So think about that, please proofread what you send and better yet, have somebody else proofread it, right? Just a second set of eyes to take a look at it and see uh, if it's done right. So again, we talk about execution, focus on the important activities. You can gather your content and customize your emails but if you aren't trying to reach buyers using different messages across different platforms, you're likely to slip through the cracks. And again, I'm going to show you this next slide. Try again. You know, I, I hear so many people say, I called, I sent one email, um, I sent one message on LinkedIn. You've got to be repetitive. You've got to find ways, be creative. You know, I, I think of the years as a, as a kid when I'd go fishing, we'd try fishing here and then we'd go to the other side of the lake and over here. Just try, try again. Persistence makes a huge difference as you go forward. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, I, I, as I said, LinkedIn, uh, if, when I'm trying to reach somebody, if I was trying to connect with my friend Jonathan here, our wonderful host, I would look on LinkedIn and I'd connect with them on LinkedIn and I'd also find who else do we have in common? Where did Jonathan work? Who do I know from his previous companies? Who could I reach out to to say, hey, I see you and Jonathan have been friends for uh, 10 years. Would you be so kind to introduce me? Here's why I say that. Years ago, somebody would say, um, here's, uh, here's Joe's number. Call Joe and tell him I asked you to give him a call. That was good. I mean, it worked. It really worked. Here's what we have found works even better. For Jonathan to say, hey, Neil, I, I know you want to meet um, you know, uh, Susie. Tell you what, why don't we set up a three-way call? Uh, or we can meet for coffee, because Susie's in the same town as we are. Uh, or we can go to lunch, or whatever it is. 
and I will give a personal introduction. I have found that works phenomenally well. Why? Because if she trusts Jonathan, there's going to be trust transference because Jonathan vetted me. Jonathan is telling Susie, hey, this is a good guy. I've known Neil for 10 years, five years, whatever the whatever it is. Um, he's a good man. He's given me a lot of good ideas. And I consider him more of a trusted advisor. Yes, is he in sales? Of course, we're all selling stuff. But he's a trusted advisor because every time he shows up, he has something of value. So that separates me from the rest of the pack right away. So number one, start with a referral as, if possible and use throughout. So the initial contact is really important. A, the initial connection, that lead source. Um, and one message has a very high likelihood of being ignored or deleted. I get them all the time. And I, I have to admit that I delete more emails than I read because most of them are terrible. They're just, and they're too long. So you saw the example I shared with you a moment ago of the email. Uh, it's, it cuts to the chase. It's to the point. I get emails that are five, six paragraphs long, and I'm just not going to read them. It's just too much. So keep that in mind. Now, how do you reach out? What can you do? There are a number of things. One, uh, you start with an email. And then a few days later, I wouldn't go two weeks later, but a few days later, you make a phone call. Right? You, you find their number. And if you can't get through, you leave a voicemail. By the way, voicemail should be what? 25, 30 seconds. If that, maybe 20 seconds, name, phone number. And I always repeat my name and phone number at the end of that voicemail. Um, secondly, send another email, right? And the next approach, maybe four or five days later, reach out on LinkedIn. Um, who knows? That might work. That might be the best way. Because think about this. Pre-COVID, people are traveling all over the place, right? More people are home working in a virtual office like I am now or like you are. Um, so they're not on as many planes as they were pre-COVID. I'm finding, we're finding people are easier to reach these days. So try LinkedIn. It's really an easy way to send messages. If that doesn't work, if you don't get a response yet, make another phone call right? And then send another email. And then you also have to know, now you have to say, wait a minute, I've reached out to this person 10 times. Um, I've had no response. Um, maybe they've moved. Maybe they're out of the business. Maybe they've retired. I don't know. But you got to know when to stop. You just have to know when to stop. So the question comes up when we do this prospecting training, how many times do I reach out, Neil? What's okay? And what ju is just really annoying? Well, here's the research we've found. And again, this is the top performance in sales prospecting from Rain Group Sales Research. Um, top producers, top salespeople can generally get make contact in two to four contacts. So it's a number of contacts acceptable to buyers who take meetings. 55% said, yeah, you know what? Reach out to me two to four times. Um, some people like 8% said, you can reach out to me more than 15 times is, is okay. Acceptable uh, before I take a meeting. I think it's too much. Look at the big bar, you're right? Two to four, five to 10, that's it. I would stop it, personally, I would stop at 10. And maybe it just means not right now. It doesn't always mean never, but not right now. So two to four contacts, five to 10 max. Again, you're gonna have to use your own judgment on that. But while the majority of respondents, 57%, indicated that two to four contacts were acceptable from a provider, trying to make an initial connection, 20%, said five to 10 attempts were acceptable. So if you need to make 11 to 15 attempts, I encourage you to review your message and try something else. Find a better way that works. And uh, I, again, you, one of the things that helped me so much for prospecting is I worked with three or four of my colleagues who I really enjoyed. We had good energy. We had similar goals. We had uh, similar goals that we were trying to accomplish in terms of prospecting, you know, how many numbers, how we we're going to do it. I asked the colleagues, let's brainstorm. So Sunday nights at eight o'clock after we put the kids to bed, we would brainstorm for about an hour on what's working with you. What did you try? We talk about different scripts that we use on the phone. And again, please keep in mind when I say scripts, I'm not talking about the robotic script. One of the worst scripts I ever heard, this is 20 years ago. Uh, when I answered the phone, I heard the person say, hello, is this the woman or the man of the house? Uh, that was pitiful. So my reply, and you know, I'm not a wise guy. I'm a, I'm a good man. My reply was actually, this is the family's golden retriever. And I've been taught to answer calls like this. How may I help you? And there was a pause and they hung up. That's a terrible script. I want you to think about your favorite actors 
And everything they say and everything to do is scripted to perfection because they practice. So there are many ways to say something, and there are usually one or two best ways. So keep that in mind as you move forward. If not having success, try something else. It makes a big difference. So again, the average number, uh, top performers generally take about five attempts to generate a desired con conversation. Um, and the rest make generally eight, eight contacts before they get in touch with who they're trying to get in touch with. So keep that in mind. Now, this is a factoid. Now, I like to use visuals because I'm a visual learner, like most people. 82% of buyers look up a provider on LinkedIn before replying to an email, voicemail, or other proactive outreach. Okay, so what? So what? Well, generally, if you do a little research on LinkedIn, you'll find that they consider people to be relevant if you have 500 connections or more. Now, LinkedIn won't say that you have 3,000 connections, it'll say 500 plus. So look at your profile. If you need to juice it up and, and make it even better uh, and maybe more brief, right? Maybe not so much in the paragraphs about yourself, um, I would really spruce that up going forward because you know people are gonna look you up on LinkedIn. Now that are, LinkedIn only started, I think it was 2006. The growth has been phenomenal. Use it as a resource. Okay, it's a wonderful way to reach out and find things that you have in common with who you're trying to reach. And keep in mind, people tend to do business with people they like and people they have things in common with. So one of the things I would do to research a prospect, I'd find out where they went to college, what their background is, what charities are they with? Are they with the Chamber of Commerce or the Boys Club or Girls Club of America? What do they do? So I, I always look for something with common ground. Maybe, maybe we grew up in the same town. And I found that when I make the phone call and say, hey, Jill, I, I see you grew up in Rhode Island. So did I. Uh, right away, we have something in common. Does it mean Jill's going to do business with me? No, but it sets a foundation. So I would encourage you, don't make just blind calls. Find out who you're reaching out to. Learn something about their background. <clears throat> now, some people would say, oh, Neil, wait a minute. That, that seems like spying. It is not spying. If it's public information, they want you to read it. That's why they put it out there. It's up to us to utilize that resource. So keep that in mind. And by the way, LinkedIn uh, um, has 740 million users, as I mentioned, in 200 countries and territories around the globe. And it actually did launch in 2003. Just to keep that in mind and keep you on track with everything else. So now we get to the winner's mindset. And I talked about 10% of the population writing goals on paper, 1% look at their goals at least once per day. So what do you wanna achieve in 2022? I encourage you, write your goals on paper. Now, I use a three by five card and I've been doing that since I was 19 years old and, and I just turned 65 yesterday. So it has been a habit that I've used for years. Now, maybe if you're gonna write a prospecting goal sheet, it's gonna be longer. And with that, make sure it's successful. Many people write their goals on paper or their plan for 2022. They do that in late December, early January. It goes in the file desk. They don't look at it again. If you write it on a smaller card and you make three copies, one goes by your computer or on your computer, another goes on your refrigerator, and another goes on your bathroom mirror. So when you're brushing your teeth and getting your hair done and doing whatever you do, there's a constant reminder. That's my goal. That's my goal. And it just stays top of mind right? You're targeted. You know exactly what you want to accomplish as you go forward. So there are little things that make a difference, like most things in life, right? There are little things that make a difference. So try that. We'll put one by your computer, on your bathroom mirror, and on the fridge. There's a constant reminder of what you're trying to accomplish in 2022. And by the way, I put the number on there. How many prospects do you want to convert to clients? And what's it going to take? How many calls? How many emails? Whatever it is, so that's your constant reminder. And that's the winner's mindset. I'm going to just steer off course just for a moment, but it still ties in a winner's mindset. Keep this in mind. You can jot this down. We have 60,000 thoughts a day. That's a six, zero, 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 zero. 60,000 thoughts a day. Are yours encouraging or yours demolishing? So if you call somebody and you get the, yeah, you know what? I don't have time to talk. I don't want to talk to you right now. You could really crush yourself right? Intellectually, emotionally to say, oh, nobody wants to take calls. Persevere, right? We control the thoughts. We can't control the weather. 
We can't control the government, how people are going to talk to us, how they're going to treat us. We do control our thoughts every single day. So keep in mind, when we talk about a winner's mindset, you, you are in charge of your attitude and your thoughts every single day. So I know before I start prospecting, before I started prospecting, I would just get myself psyched up and I'd think about the best calls I had that week uh, or the week before. And you put yourself in that right mindset to get ready to make calls. And, and was I thinking about the negative things? No, no, I'm thinking about the successes. You know, one of the things I do with my kids, and if you have young kids, try this. Um, when one of my kids was waking up in a terrible mood um, every morning, I realized I need to change the tape in his head. So one night I asked him uh, at, at night, I said, Nikki, how was your day? Oh, daddy, I had a terrible day. I fell down, I broke a toy. I had a fight with my best friend. He'd been friends for two weeks with this kid. And I realized when he went to bed, it was almost like us watching the evening news. What's news? Whether it's the noon news or 7 a.m. news or 5 p.m. or 10, it's all garbage. It's negative. So I realized I had to change the tape in his head. I'm sharing this with you as a, as a parent, but also as a businessman, as a business person. Before you go to bed, think about your successes that day. What was the best part of your day? What was the best call? What was the best email? What was the best response? Think about those things before you rest and go to sleep and you'll wake up in a much better mood and you'll be energized. Why do I say that? Because when I talk to people about the thoughts they have and how many thoughts they have each day that are empowering out of those 60,000, many people say, no, I constantly criticize myself. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not whatever enough. Don't put yourself down, especially when you're prospecting. You want to have that winner's mindset. You want to go with a great attitude. And I have found, like I'm standing about a stand-up desk. I find it's much easier for me to make phone calls when I'm standing. The energy's flowing. And the best time to prospect, right after you've had a successful call and you closed a meeting, you've got, a, you've got an appointment. That's the best time to keep prospecting because people can read, they can hear, they can hear your confidence. They can hear, you know, what you're doing and how, how confident and proud you are of what you're representing. So enough on the winner's mindset. And it's a big one. Finally, set realistic goals. I've seen so many people say, I want to see if I can get 50 new pro uh, clients this year. All right, maybe, maybe it's possible. You know what? How about starting with five for the month? or three for the month, or, or 10 for the quarter, whatever you're going to do, set realistic goals. Why? Why is that important? Because if you just set lofty goals that are way beyond reach, you'll continue to be frustrated. And here's one thing I also want you to in, uh, jot down, please, in your notes. Measure your progress. Don't measure perfection. Measure your progress. When you find people who are perfectionists, they're constantly frustrated because nothing is ever enough. But in January, if you say, okay, I'm starting at zero, let's see what I can do in one month when it comes to prospecting, email, phone calls, all these things, referrals, what can I do? And at the end of the month, you get three. You have three appointments, maybe even three clients. Look at that, you went from zero to three. Now, if your goal was 20, now you're really frustrated. You're like, I'm such a loser, I can't do this. It's, it just doesn't work. Neil Wood gave this webinar on prospecting, and it just doesn't work, darn it. Set realistic goals. Right? Be your own best friend. Um, break down the numbers to reveal how many phone calls do you have to make? How many emails? How do you have to rearrange that email so it will get opened, right? Look at all those things that are important. How many opportunities can you put in the pipeline? How many qualified opportunities can you get to advance? And finally, sales wins to hit your goal. What can you do to hit your goal? And again, keep that in mind. Have those goals written out. It makes a huge difference. Now, we're going to talk about greatest impact activity. And I'm going to share this because I find so many people saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to start prospecting maybe next week. You know, next week is always a real good time to start prospecting. How about now? How about putting it in your calendar? Here's what we have found with the research at Rain Group. When people calendar it, they are more likely to make it happen because that calendar pops up in the morning with a reminder, oh, yeah, great impact activity. I got to do my prospecting. It makes a huge difference. So put it in your calendar. And what do I mean by GIA? The one activity that should you do it consistently at high quality will get you the greatest eventual return on your time investment. 
put your GIA first. It makes a huge difference. So master virtual selling. Uh, you know, there's a terrific book on virtual selling that you'll find on Amazon by um, by Mike Schultz and uh, um, Dave Shaby and Andy Springer. Fantastic on virtual selling. And it, it's one of the things that help so many people master virtual selling. 80% uh, B2B decision makers expect sales model changes to stay. 85% expect hybrid sellers to be the most common role in three years. What I mean by hybrid, face-to-face -face and virtual selling. Master it. Become excellent at it. Suppliers who provide outstanding digital experiences are more than two times, more than two times as likely to be chosen as a primary supplier than those who provide poor experiences. So maybe you haven't been a master at virtual selling. Anything can be learned. So think about that. Sellers who do a poor job in the areas that, that most influence buyer purchase decisions. Remember I talked about this earlier? 71% um, said that is a major uh, influence on my buyer purchase decision. And yet only 26% of sellers are good at it. Um, it's, it just makes a big difference. So look at this, find out how can I be better at what I do, right? As far as showing what's possible, only 34% of sellers do it right. And yet it's really important. 68% said, this is really important to me. Listening, 26% of sellers are good at listening. And, and yet 68% of the buyers said, this is really important. I want them to listen. I don't want them to just show up and chat and, and waste my time. And finally, making a strong ROI case. So there are so many little things you can do that'll set you apart from the herd. I never want to settle for mediocrity. And the top sellers are not in mediocrity. They lead the pack. So what can you work on? How are you listening? And in fact, going forward from today, pay attention to people talking and watch how many interrupt each other. Someone can't even finish a thought. I, would, I just watched this at a party Saturday night, right? So pay attention to these four points. And again, you can do a screenshot. You're going to get the PDF tomorrow of the slides. This is a big one. This will make you different from the pack and put you at the top of the pack. So finally, when we talk about building your 2022 prospecting plan, number one is value. Create a solid value proposition. Gather influential content. Number two, attraction campaign. Remember we talked about wave. I'm going a little bit around the corner here. Attraction, identify your targets, make the right offer, customize your messages as you saw in the example I shared. Execution, Test different outreach approaches. If something doesn't work, try something else. I don't know what's going to work. Just keep trying and manage your online presence. I have found the people who do at least one post a week on LinkedIn, don't do five, but at least one post, stay top of mind. Okay, so we can talk more about that another time. And finally, the winner's mindset, set realistic goals and make prospecting your greatest impact activity. That's the thing. And the bonus, master virtual selling. Get better at what you're doing, right? It's it's simple, like most things in life, and uh, you never know what you can do. Again, measure your progress. So Jonathan, we kick it back to you, my friend. <laughs> Thanks so much, Neil. That was awesome. <laughs> so, where do we go from here? Well, if you're looking to apply the insights and information that Neil presented from this webinar and catch up on the latest sales trends, tactics, strategies. We're offering our online on-demand sales training programs from Rain Group up to 50% off through Friday. Whether you're looking to improve your prospecting skills, grow your accounts, or hold better buyer conversations, these programs will get you well on your way to hitting your goals in 2022. So where do you go? Well, as you can see on your screen, just head down to that URL. It's raingroup.com slash elearning raingroup.com slash e-learning to learn more about these programs and enroll. Now, Neil, before we go anywhere, we do have a few questions uh, in our remaining nine minutes of our right. webinar. Maybe we can throw some out here to you sure. to get your insights and, 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 and thoughts. Happy to help. Um, let's see. This is regarding the number of contacts. We have a, a which one was it? Jim Sexton, he said regarding the number of contacts acceptable to buyers. So how many times we have these touches, five or eight, over what time frame would you recommend that? 
Well, that's good. And one of the things I talked about was uh, emailing on a Monday and maybe calling on a Thursday. I would do that over, over three weeks if you're comfortable with that, right? Um, some people would try to cram it all into one week. It's too much. It's too much. And two weeks, I think, is, is just too tight. So I would extend that over three to four weeks and see what you can accomplish. And thank you for the question. I appreciate that. Nice. Thanks. Uh, along the same lines, Neil, Justin asks, as you work through the outreach process or plan, do you change the intensity of the message to help get action? Yeah, if the first message isn't working, and if I've sent a message like that to 10 different prospects and I'm not getting responses, absolutely, you got to adjust it. You got to tweak it. Maybe it's not specific enough. Maybe it's too long. I worked with a company last week where we worked on emails, uh, and the first drafts they had were four paragraphs. We tweaked it. We put it down to maybe five sentences. And what we found is they had a better response rate. So yeah, it's, it's a constant, it's iterative. You know, we're constantly adjusting it and massaging it to make it work. Try everything. If something doesn't work, try it again, differently. Great, thanks. Would you mind reminding us who was the author you recommended for virtual selling? Oh, Mike Schultz uh, and Dave Shaby. So Mike Schultz, you'll find this on Amazon, S-C-H-U-L-T-Z. And you'll also find another author, Dave Shaby, S-H-A-B-Y, as well as Andy Springer. Great book. And think about this. Now we're in the holidays. Great time to do some reading, right? And, and I don't know how you read, but I, I take notes. I dog ear the pages. And if you say, Neil, I don't have time to read a book, it's available on Audible. So you can listen while you drive or while you walk the beach or go for your daily walk. So a terrific book. Thanks. Talking about emails, here we have a question from Ian. What is your view on using images or color in your emails? Not I like it. Text. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I like. I think it's a great idea, especially it, it, unless it gets stopped from a spam filter. As a visual guy, I think it's really effective to add add a picture in there of something that's relevant. Um, you know, we learn in three ways, right? Visual, auditory, kinesthetic, right? Get to feel it, touch it, do it. Um, I most people learn visually. So at least for a large percentage of the way they learn, I like the idea of pictures. And I, I, uh, I encourage you to give it a shot, see what happens. Great, thanks. Also talking about emails, we have another question that is, what has been your success when emails don't reach the prospect, such as caught in spam filters? What do you do in those situations? It won't be as successful. And that's why I talked about this adding an image. Sometimes those images will get just blocked out from the spam, spam filter. Now, that's another reason why we try other ways. If you're finding the email is not working, that's why you try the phone, right? Or you try LinkedIn uh, or snail mail. I'm not a big fan of snail mail, but you know what? It, it still works. It just still works. But um, the phone calls, remember, most people really uh, at least are open to a phone call. It doesn't mean they'll take it, but 82% are open to a phone call. So keep that in mind. And again, between that and LinkedIn, eventually, eventually you get through the door. You might get a no, you might get a yes. I look at it this way. If I get a no, they weren't a client anyway. I had nothing to lose. And the more people I reach out to and I play those numbers, the more likelihood I'll find success. Great, thanks. Changing topics just uh, real quick. Here we have a question from Rob Stenberg, who, who's talking about the three-legged stool. Why act? Why now? Why us? Why trust? His question is, why shouldn't why trust come first? They don't trust, then won't act, and they won't act now, correct? Well, Maybe splitting to... hairs, but trust is a must. What are no, your thoughts? Your trust, trust is a must, absolutely. And think about this. When you think of all the relationships you have, it could take it could take a year, maybe years to develop trust. We can break it like that, right? With one broken promise or one bad word. What we want to do with Resonate is find out what are the challenges, challenges, afflictions, needs, aspirations. We want to grab their attention first. And then once, once we find out what they have, then we can differentiate a little bit and substantiate why trust us. Well, at first you want to find out, is there a need? Is there a need to even talk with you? 
right? So that's where the why act and why now. We're trying to figure out what, as we say at Rain Group, where are you stuck? What's holding you back from where you're trying to get? And that comes up in the conversation. That comes up with asking good questions, probing, listening, right? Keep in mind, listen and silent have the same letters. They're just rearranged. And so the only way we can listen is if we are silent. So that's the first part of it. We want to find out what are the challenges? What are they trying to what are they trying to accomplish? What's holding them back? And what are their goals? And that's where you get that initial value gap. And then you can provide a solution and say, you know, we've worked with other businesses like yours. Here's what we've done that's really worked well for them. And right with that, you're sharing success stories. So they know that you're relevant and you've done this before. It's not your first rodeo. Great, thanks. We do have several questions that regarding use of video. Where does that rank in prospecting, such as like Vidyard? What do you think? <clears throat> it's really gaining popularity now. And I'll tell you, uh, you can do this on LinkedIn. You can also, if, if someone has given you permission to text them, you can create a video on your phone so easily. I like Vidyard. And they also have, they have a free program uh, to get you started. It's really simple. Uh, I'm gonna give you a tip, you're gonna create a video. You can do it like this and hold the phone up to your face. I wouldn't recommend that unless you have to. Get a simple stand, a tripod. They're not expensive. I'm talking about 20, 25 bucks. And put your phone on that. There's actually a phone holder you can buy on Amazon, for example, or wherever. Um, so you set your phone up, you set a remote, and you say, hey, Jim, uh, Neil Wood with XYZ Company, I'd really like to catch up with you about 10 minutes. What time would work best for you? Uh, whatever you're going to say. With that, I'd always have a script in terms of what you want to say. You don't want to ramble on for three minutes. We don't do three-minute videos, folks. 30 seconds, 40 seconds, you can accomplish a heck of a lot. Here's what I like about it. They get to see your energy. They get to see, are you, are you taking care of yourself? You, you know, you're well, whatever, your hair brushed and combed and, um, you know, what's your energy level? I think it's ideal. Now, a lot of people say, Neil, I don't want to do videos. I'm not comfortable on film. Get comfortable on film. You know what? There are millions of videos on YouTube, millions and millions. Get comfortable. How do you do that? Practice. Practice as much as you can. And the more you do, it's just going to get easier. Like everything else we master, we practice it. I mean, you'll have some blooper reels and that's okay. The, the beauty of creating a video, you can delete it and try it again, right? So uh, really gaining a lot of popularity right now. Again, you can use it on your phone. You can use it on LinkedIn. So you can even send an email, but you just want to keep them short, okay? Right, thanks. We are in a virtual world and look at us here on, on Zoom conducting business as well. <laughs> Well, it is the top of the hour. So with that, that has to conclude our Q&A for this section here. Thank you so much for your insight, Neil. That was really informative. That concludes our webinar and Q&A for today. Just a reminder, once again, we did have a recording of this event. Tomorrow, you'll be receiving an email with links to watch the recording and also a PDF download of all the slides and an access to a goals worksheet. So please have a look out in your inbox tomorrow you'll be getting these emails. So we'd like to give a thank you to everyone who joined us today for our webinar and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank Thanks you. everyone.